Hi, welcome to another edition of Rheumatology Highlights Report. My name is Elaine Husney. I'm Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine, and I'm also the Vice Chair of the Department of Rheumatic and Immunologic Diseases uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. Today, I've been charged with talking about updates in cardiovascular effects in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, giving you updates from the most recent ACR meeting. Overall, there's been a lot of convincing evidence that rheumatoid arthritis is an independent risk factor for premature cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. The chronic inflammatory burden that's associated with rheumatoid arthritis um, has been shown in epidemiologic studies. However, the precise mechanism is unclear. We're hoping that further studies investigate this link and that we would be able to further delineate uh, the exact mechanisms associated with premature atherosclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis. Over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I hope to summarize some of the very uh, important novel events um, that have occurred in this field. The first chapter will be looking at HDL function, and not necessarily HDL levels um, are going to be important. So what do I mean by that? We're going to look at something called cholesterol efflux capacity, how it relates to high-density lipoprotein and atherosclerosis. It is well known that HDL functionality, in addition to HDL levels, can be important in cardiovascular function. As you know, HDL has a multiple functions, as depicted by this diagram. Its antioxidant capacity, inhibiting LDL oxidation, is one of its most well-known, but it can also modulate endothelial function, have anti-inflammatory properties, as well as anti-thrombotic properties. Today, we're going to concentrate on an abstract that looks at HDL and reverse cholesterol transport, which essentially is promoting cholesterol efflux. So in a recent article in New England Journal of Medicine, the role of HDL and cholesterol efflux capacity was highlighted. HDL may provide cardiovascular protection by promoting reverse cholesterol transport from macrophages, which can serve as a predictor for atherosclerotic burden. It is hypothesized that the capacity of HDL to accept cholesterol from macrophages would serve as a predictor for this burden. And measured cholesterol efflux um, capacity was uh, observed in 203 healthy volunteers versus 442 patients with angiographic confirmed coronary artery disease, as well as 351 patients without confirmed disease. And what they found here was that cholesterol efflux capacity from macrophages could be a metric of HDL function and has been shown to inversely associated with CIMT, which is carotid intimal media thickness, and angiographic CAD. And this is independently of the HDL cholesterol level. So this helps bring light into the fact that it's not just the L HDL level, but it's also the HDL functionality, which can be measured by the cholesterol efflux. So here's a diagram of what reverse cholesterol transport describes. The HDL-mediated cholesterol efflux means the delivery of cholesterol from non-hepatic cells and subsequent delivery to the liver. And recent report has shown an inverse relationship between the efflux capacity of a patient sample and an increased carotid atherosclerotic uh, burden. There's been very few reports done on this in rheumatoid arthritis. McMahon et al. did report in a small study of pro-inflammatory HDL looking at the functionality of HDL in RA patients. They have found that this dysfunctional or pro-inflammatory HDL lacks the ability to protect against the LDL oxidation. So in this next slide, it's just a schematic of what actually happens um, in cells on, that are plated for cholesterol efflux study. So as you can see on number one, the plate cells are labeled. Number two, they're incubated. And number three, um, the extra and intracellular cholesterol are measured. So getting back to the abstract seen in this latest ACR meeting, this looked at cholesterol efflux by high-density lipoproteins is impaired in patients with active rheumatoid arthritis. This particular abstract looked at the reverse cholesterol transport, which is uh, abbreviated as RCT. Here they took 40 patients with RA and 40 patients with matched controls, and they looked at the HDL functionality, measured also the disease activity, and significantly found a decreased ability to promote this cholesterol efflux compared to HDL from patients with low disease activity. 
So thus, patients with high disease activity had promoted more cholesterol efflux compared to patients with low disease activity. Their conclusion was that the attenuation of HDL function may suggest a possible mechanism by which active RA contributes to this increased cardiovascular risk. The next group of slides is looking at statin use and the risk of MI in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The question remains whether or not statins confer a cardiovascular advantage in RA patients using a primary outcome of acute myocardial infarction. This particular study was uh, conducted as a longitudinal study following RA patients from May of 1996 to March of 2006 in British Columbia. They wanted to quantify the impact of statin inhibition on the risk of having an MI. They followed over 15,000 person years in a matched cohort of over 3,000 initiators versus 3,000 non-initiators. They found over 260 myocardial infarction events were identified. In conclusion, their data suggested that in those RA patients that used statin, it was associated with a 31% lower risk of acute myocardial infarction. These findings provide some evidence for a postulated cardioprotective role of statin in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. In our next group, we're going to look at the effect of disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs on cardiovascular disease and rheumatoid arthritis. There has been many, many abstracts this year looking at the effects of this immunomodulating agent used to treat RA and their effect on cardiovascular disease. The risk of cardiovascular disease is increased, as we know, in rheumatoid arthritis. And prior studies have often suggested that TNF blockade may reduce the risk of these cardiovascular events. We will take the next couple abstracts to take a look at these. The first abstract is talking about reduced cardiovascular risk with the use of methotrexate and TNF inhibitors. They looked at the independent contribution of each of the use of methotrexate and the use of TNF inhibitors for cardiovascular disease. In over 1,800 RA patients, they were split into users and non-users of methotrexate, users and non-users of anti-TNF therapy. The use of methotrexate or TNF inhibitors was independently associated with a 46 reduction in incident cardiovascular disease compared to non-users. When used for more than two years or 24 months, the risk was further decreased by 67% and 76% respectively. So this raises the possibility that TNF inhibitors offers additional cardioprotective effects for our patients with rheumatoid arthritis. However, in the meeting, there are other abstracts that had different conclusions. This one looked at the effects of TNF inhibitors on lipid profile and subclinical atherosclerosis. 30 publication and abstracts were included up to May of 2010, representing over 1,100 RA patients. Anti-TNF alpha caused actually no significant change in flow-mediated dilatation, but did improve disease activity and systemic inflammation, as we would expect with these drugs. Despite the significant decrease in the inflammation, however, due to these drugs, anti-TNF alpha caused no change in the carotid intima media thickness measured by IMT or ultrasound, endothelial dysfunction as measured by flow media dilatation, or the lipid profiles um, that were measured in this group. In this graph, it shows differences in the parameters of the lipid profiles um, after TNF blockade at baseline, four weeks, 16 weeks, and up to one year. And as you can see, that there have been no difference over time on the lipid profile. In this next slide, we also look at cardiovascular risk reduction associated with TNF blockade. This is an observational study looking at administrative databases of HMO, Medicare, Medicaid, between 1998 and 2007, with patients that had at least two diagnoses of RA and previously used methotrexate. The follow-up period began when another non-biologic disease modifier or a TNF was added substituting for methotrexate, creating two groups of what they call new users, new users of non-biologics and new users of anti-TNF. This looked at a total source population of over 139,000 patients, 22,907 were potentially eligible. And in terms of the new users, it ended up that over 9,000 were new users for non-biologic DMARDs, 
and over 7,700 were new users for anti-TNF. Potential cardiovascular benefits of TNF were only seen among those that were greater than 65, with a hazard ratio of 0.1, compared to those less than 65 years old with a hazard ratio of 1.2. Found a trend towards reduced cardiovascular risks were found among the new users compared to the non-biologic DMARD users. But unfortunately, these effects waned after six months. The authors concluded that a randomized control trial would be helpful to clarify these relationships. Going to the next group of abstracts, we wanted to concentrate to look at what does the inflammatory burden, someone with different disease duration or higher disease duration of rheumatoid arthritis have to do with their cardiovascular disease risk. The first abstract in this group looked at the risk of cardiovascular disease in RA was independent of disease duration and the level of disease activity. A little bit different from what prior literature has shown, they investigated the relationship of disease duration of inflammation and risk of CVD. The effect of disease duration on the risk of the first cardiovascular event was estimated by Kaplan-Meier analysis curves. Over 850 patients with over 6,300 patient years were included. 91 cardiovascular events were recorded during the follow-up. And their conclusion was that the duration of RA, meaning the length of time a patient is exposed to this inflammation, did not appear to further aggravate the risk of cardiovascular disease. So what does this mean? Specifically, it meant that the risk of cardiovascular disease in RA patients did not increase after 10 years of disease duration compared to the first 10 years of having the disease. Here we see the graphs of the Kaplan-Meier curve. These are cumulative survival curves for different levels of patients with DAS28 before and after 10 years of disease duration. The next abstract looked at the effects of disease activity on lipoprotein in early RA patients. This was to analyze the relationship between total cholesterol and its subfraction, as well as oxidized LDL, and different variables in the early RA population. Data was collected from over 200 patients, and follow-up ranged from two to five years with over a total of 540 visits with lipid measurements. They concluded that total cholesterol levels significantly decreased with increasing degree of arthritis activity. This was mainly due to the HDL portion, and conversely, the oxidized LDL levels significantly increased with increasing disease activity. So as you can see, there's a lot of interest in this area, and unfortunately still remain some discrepancies in the overall conclusions um, of this in regards to lipoprotein levels and the effect of treatment. The last abstract in this group looks at inflammatory burden predicting plaque formation. This study looked at the evaluation of the role of inflammatory burden in the formation of carotid plaques in RA patients. Over 400 patients with RA had ultrasound done, both looking at carotid intima media thickness as well as plaques were measured. The results show that the frequency of carotid plaques and mean IMT were significantly increased in the RA group compared to normal controls. These findings indicate that inflammatory burden can increase the risk of carotid plaque formation in RA. Now we'll turn our attention uh, to the last group of, of abstracts, looking at cardiac morphology studies assessing the atherosclerotic burden. So these next abstracts looked at a very interesting way to uh, look at measuring morphologic changes in cardiac disease. So recent area of studies looking at how these changes occur in the cardiac muscle as well as the coronary vessels. We can look at art arterial wall modeling, which arteries can react due to hemodynamic stresses. We can look at cardiac plaque morphology, meaning really assessing whether the plaque is calcified, non-calcified, or mixed plaque. And lastly, looking at cardiac muscle remodeling, looking at left ventricular mass size. So looking at the first abstract, looking at carotid arterial wall remodeling. As we stated before, our arteries are going to react to hemodynamic stress. In order to maintain its wall stress, changes by arterial remodeling must occur. This has not been well studied in RA patients, but has been very well studied in patients uh, with carotid artery disease. This particular abstract took 96 RA patients and 274 healthy controls. Their primary measures were looking at arterial wall parameters, carotid IMT, interadventitial diameter, IAD, or, and lumen diameter, or LD. RA patients had 6.3% greater wall-to-lumen ratio, indicated by 
the wall thinness or outward remodeling compared to controls. So in this early study, this showed that RA is associated with outward remodeling. So why is outward remodeling important? This is relevant in view of the association between outward remodeling and plaque instability and rupture. The next abstract looks at differential predictors of mixed and fully calcified coronary plaques, area of great interest. As we know, different plaques, depending on their composition, may have different atherosclerotic burden and different risks in terms of plaque rupture. So here they took 150 patients with rheumatoid arthritis and tested their coronary plaque evaluation, looking at the type of plaque as well as epicardial adipose tissue, known as EAT, or thoracic adipose tissue, known as TAT volumes. This was done using multi-detector computed tomography angiography, or MDCT. The highest quartiles of the TAT, or thoracic adipose tissue accumulation, were significantly associated with higher adjusted ratio of mixed plaque prevalence. By contrast, people that were treated with anti-TNF in this group who underwent MDCT was associated with a 70% lower risk for this mixed plaque. The presence of this high-risk mixed plaque becomes important as mixed plaque was positively predicted by parameters of ongoing inflammation and TAT, or thoracic adipose tissue accumulation, was inversely related to the treatment of TNF, despite these patients having active disease. So calcified plaque was also associated with higher subject age. So here, just to review those results, is a table looking at the crude and adjusted values of mixed versus calcified plaque. So mixed plaques are tend to be more prone to rupture in what we are looking at here. And of significance on this chart is that you see that uh, CRP and DOS, as well as TAT and age, are uh, clinically significant parameters to predict mixed plaque. This next abstract looks at etanercept, a TNF inhibitor, inducing a decrease in left ventricular mass in patients with RA. To assess the influence of TNF inhibitors or synthetic drug disease-modifying agents on left ventricular morphology, macrocirculation, as well as microcirculation in RA patients. Once again, although this has been studied in patients without rheumatoid arthritis, very little is known in our patients with RA. Their primary outcome was looking at biologic monitoring of echo, pulse wave velocity, as well as retinal artery caliber. These were performed at baseline, month three, month six, looking at etanercept as well as synthetic DMARDs. A small group of 38 female patients with active RA was studied, and etanercept did show a significant decrease in left ventricular mass, whereas the synthetic DMARD did not influence this cardiac remodeling. The author's conclusion suggested that TNF may be a main factor of left ventricular hypertrophy and could partly explain the previously reported benefit of TNF on cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So in conclusion, it is very important to remember that knowing what the cardiac risk factors in your patients are are very important. That's a critical first step to assess. Second, we do need some consensus on how to best study subclinical or premature atherosclerosis in our patients. We hope that further clinical trials will be done based on all this exciting data that we see from the ACR meeting this year to help define the impact of immunomodulary therapies and tight control of RA disease on cardiovascular outcomes. In conclusion, it's important to remember that our RA patients may serve as a unique model to study the impact of chronic inflammatory burden on premature atherosclerosis. We hope even that the potential of inflammatory modulation in RA patients may provide some insights in halting atherosclerosis, not only in our patients, but also in the general population. Once again, I want to thank you for your time and attention um, to our RHR series. I hope these past 15 minutes have given you some insight into the premature cardiovascular risks that are seen in rheumatoid arthritis patients. Thank you.